EDTA titrations. What is EDTA? This stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. When you look at the molecular structure, what you see is in the center, we have an ethylene with two um, amines at the ends. So we have those two nitrogens here from the diamine. And we also have bonded to that four different acetic acid groups, thus the tetraacetic acid. EDTA is our most commonly used multidentate ligand. So let's break that terminology down. Ligand is a species that binds to a metal ion. And multidentate ligands are called dentate and far as toothed. And what that means is that they bind to metal ions through more than one atom. So they have multiple teeth to bind and grip onto something. EDTA is used for complexometric titrations. So titration, of course, is an analytical method where we have liquids, one of which has a known concentration, and you measure carefully the volumes required to react. So we know titration, complexometric means that this is based on a formation of a complex between two different chemicals. It's important when we discuss EDTA titrations to understand that EDTA is a hexaprotic acid. That means it has six protons that it can give up, and those six protons are drawn in this lovely light blue color here. And being hexaprotic, that also means it has six different pKa values, and those six pKa values are listed pK1 through pK6. If we examine the fractional composition of what form EDTA takes at different pHs, you see that when we have a high pH, um, so we're above pK6 here, that EDTA is in this fully deprotonated form, as you'd expect a basic pH to be deprotonated. And this Y4 minus form is a very important form of EDTA. As you shift to lower concentrations, and we're heading this way on the pH scale, we have less and less of our EDTA in that form. And these rise and falls in the dominant form show us that you're getting, of course, more protons at lower pH. So the takeaway from this is that the dominant form of EDTA depends on the pH, but we are going to treat EDTA titrations as if all of the EDTA, the free unbound EDTA, is in this Y4 minus form. In this Y4 minus form, we have a strong one-to-one -one complex with metal ions. So EDTA in its simplified structure here now, the six binding sites for EDTA from that hexaprotic acid portion of it are the two nitrogens, and of course the four acetic acid carboxylate groups. So two nitrogens, and then one, two, three, four carboxylates. If you take that plus really any metal, in this case manganese two plus, and you let them react, what you see is that the metal is going to be in the center. So there's metal in the center. And then the EDTA has bonded to it in the six different places. And so it's wrapped around and bonded to this metal, but it takes one EDTA molecule to complex with one metal. So although it's EDTA, and we always talk about it being Y4 minus, and it's hexaprotic, it is chelating this and bonding to it in six sites. So it's still a one-to-one -one complex. To drive that home even further, I have this big bold slide that says that the stoichiometry between EDTA and metal is always one-to-one. -one. And that does not depend at all on the charge of the metal ion. Um, so anything, it could be iron three plus, could be calcium two plus, two, three, who cares? It's going to be a one-to-one -one complex. Um, univalent ions, things like sodium and potassium, those don't necessarily work the same way with EDTA. So we're talking transition metals and anything with not a single plus charge. EDTA titrations are, in a sense, acid-base reactions. And to understand this, you have to look at the Lewis acid and base definitions. And in the Lewis definitions, acids are electron acceptors, while bases are electron donors, giving those electrons to the acids. Ligands, such as EDTA, give electrons to metals. They donate them. And so based on the Lewis acid definition, EDTA is a Lewis base and metals therefore are Lewis acid. The equilibrium that's going on here is this complexation of the, the formation of this complexation. So we have any metal. So here M is just any metal. 
and it has a certain positive charge. And then we have EDTA, and EDTA, I already mentioned, Y4 minus is the typical abbreviation for it. So we're in equilibrium here, and the formation constant, Kf, is the concentration of the complex, which is our product, over, of course, the com concentrations of free EDTA and the metal. This also is called the stability constant, stability referring to the complex. And if you have a large Kf, that means you have a very stable complex, it's likely to form this complex, and therefore your reaction is more complete. Here's a table. We love tables. Tables are so much fun on YouTube. Um, not really, but hey, you might as well have it for your studying, right? Um, what this is showing you is a log of the Kf values. Of course, the Kf values can have a large range of concentrations, and so log of Kf is a useful way of plotting them. In order to get Kf, you have to then take the anti-log or 10 to the power of this value in the table. Be careful, I know a lot of us are used to working with like pKa's and p-values are 10 to the minus something if you want to get the something, um, but this is not a 10 to the minus table. This is simply log of Kf. It's not a p-Kf, okay? So if I want the Kf value for, I don't know, neodymium 3 plus, I'm going to take 10 to the power of 16.51, and that's going to give me my straight up Kf. There is a problem with Kf, and that problem is this fact that we're assuming EDT is in the Y4 minus form, but that's really only true over here, where you've got a pH um, where that's the dominant species. And if your pH is less than 10.37, which is that pKa6, then we don't actually have most of the EDTA in that form. So what we're going to do is we're going to account for the fact that EDTA speciates between all of these different forms based on pH, and we're going to introduce a term which is going to be called the fraction, um, alpha being a lovely fraction term of Y4 minus. So Y4 minus, as far as the actual fraction, what we're basically doing is saying how far up this curve are we? And so you now have this table where it shows you that, hey, well, not surprisingly, at pH 13 and 14, which are out here, you have 100% Y4 minus. But once you've gotten down to like a pH of say nine, you have a really small portion, like 4% of the EDTA is in that form. And it becomes increasingly smaller as you go to lower pH. Next, what you do is you adjust your formation constant to the conditions, the conditions being the pH. So we have something that's similar to Kf, but adjusts it for how much EDTA is in our Y4 minus form. So same equilibrium reaction, but we have this adjusted equilibrium constant where we're taking our fraction in the Y4 minus form times the normal unadjusted non-conditional Kf, right, right here, um, for the particular metal and EDTA. Because of this dependence on pH, the completeness and therefore the usefulness of EDTA complexation um, really depends on pH. So here you have a titration curve. It's followed by electrochemistry. So the y-axis is potential on a electrode. The x-axis, though, is the volume you've added in your titration. And what you see is that you really can't follow anything at pH 5. But as you get to more basic pH, you start to have this inflection point right here. And the sharpness of that inflection point means, of course, a more useful titration. With the lower pHs, the reason why this isn't working is that we have a really small portion of EDTA in our Y4 minus form, so a much smaller Kf prime. The complex formation, therefore, is less complete, and the EDTA titration is less effective because those transitions, um, the formation of that complex is really blurred. But the pH dependence is not all a problem. It can also be very useful. You can change the pH to allow you to select for certain metals in a solution. So if you have a, a mixture, you can pick one um, if you're lucky. So metals that have a higher formation constant, this higher Kf, um, can be titrated at a lower pH. That's because if you are looking at Kf prime being equal to the fraction of Y4 minus times Kf, if this Kf here is bigger, you can survive a decrease 
in the fraction of EDTA and still have something that gives you a reasonable happy result for KF prime. Okay. Um, for example, say that you have iron 3 plus, which has a large KF value mixed with calcium, which has a less large, right? So this difference in log of KF values is 15. So that's 15 power difference. If you titrate this at a low pH, like pH 4, the EDTA is still capable of binding iron 3 plus, but the calcium binds very little. And so you're able to selectively bind iron 3 plus and measure just it. EDTA titration curves, of course, we have the volume added of EDTA. EDTA is the thing that has known concentration. Um, you know it because you make it from dry, pure EDTA, and you can calculate the concentration. You put that in your burette. You drip that into your solution that has an unknown metal concentration. Um, if you wanted to make a titration curve, then you would be following the metal. And so this is assuming a large equilibrium constant and a complete reaction. So you have to have a formation constant adjusted to pH that's much larger than one. This means that we can assume the EDT and metal react completely with each other and instantly as soon as you drop that EDT into solution. And so we treat this similarly to a strong acid and strong base. The y-axis of a titration curve here then would be PM um, or the p-value of the metal. And so this is like any other p-value, negative log of is power. So if we had p calcium two plus, that would be negative log of calcium two plus. And that's our y-axis here. So PM, okay? And you could in principle go through and you can calculate the concentration of EDTA and of the metal using the equilibrium constant and the moles of each and their concentrations at every point in the titration curve. Um, and that's an exercise you could go to through if you wish. I don't wish at the moment. What I do want you to think about is the possibility that your titration might need an auxiliary complexing agent. So the problem that this solves is that at high pH, and of course we like high pH because that's where we have lots of Y4 minus for the EDTA. At high pH, a lot of metals form precipitates with hydroxide. They have these metal hydroxide precipitates. And that's because when you have a high pH, there's a lot of OH minus around and that's hydroxide. So it's there to precipitate with your metal. And if your metal is precipitated, that means your metal is not available to bind with EDTA and you're not going to measure all of your metal. So we get a frowny face. We don't like that. The auxiliary complexing agent is something that you add in. It's a ligand as well. And it binds to the metal loosely and temporarily to keep the metal from precipitating with the hydroxide. Examples are ammonia, um, tartrate, citrate, triethanolamine. These are lovely, um, slightly negative, weak ligands. And so with ammonia, for example, here, we have our lone pair on the nitrogen. And that can donate the electrons to the metal and coordinate with that metal. Um, it's actually a pretty good idea if you are making a buffer to control the pH to go ahead and make your buffer using one of these ligands. That way it's around. So at um, high pH, we can make an ammonium buffer. And so you're accomplishing two things, controlling pH and having this auxiliary complexing agent present. Once you add the EDTA in, the auxiliary complexing agent then releases the metal over to the EDTA, it transfers it. And therefore, it's actually super important that you choose a complexing agent that mustn't bind the metal more strongly than EDTA binds the metal. If your auxiliary complexing agent just holds onto that metal indefinitely and never gives it to the EDTA, then you've done no help at all. You might as well have let it precipitate in the first place because it's still not available. So we have to monitor EDTA titrations. I mentioned earlier that you can use potentiometry, um, which is of course an electrochemical measurement. The other thing though is metal ion indicators. And these are compounds that change color if they are bound to the metal ion, and that's pretty helpful. The metal ion indicator has to bind to the metal ion less strongly than EDTA does. Again, you want the indicator to give the metal over to the EDTA. The reaction um, of this giving up from the indicator to the EDTA is as shown here. So just as an example, we have magnesium, but really this works for any metal. So magnesium with the indicator, the indicator is red in this case when it's bound. You add the EDTA. Now the magnesium goes with the EDTA and you get the free indicator. So the idea here is always that the indicator is bound to the metal originally, 
And then when EDTA comes and kicks the indicator off, the indicator becomes free and changes color. Here, IN, by the way, is the abbreviation for indicator. It is not our friendly element indium. Don't be confused. Um, and of course, you can use electrodes as an alternative if you don't have a good metal ion indicator. Um, Mercury electrodes, ion selective electrodes are all good options. So the metal ion indicators, there are many of them. Um, you can find tables and information elsewhere, but here are an example of three. You notice that they actually have their own pKa values. So they have protons that they can release, and I'll mention in a moment that therefore their usefulness depends on pH. Also, the color of the free indicator um, really also depends on pH. So you've got, for example, Ariacum black T in the middle here has two pKa values, which means it has three species, um, and each of those different species is a different color. So you've got red, blue, and orange. When it's complex with the metal, you have a wine red color. So at the start of a titration with a Ryacom black tea, I expect to see a beautiful wine red color when that indicator has the metal. And then as I drop in my EDTA solution from the burette, I expect to see that wine red color transition over to the free indicator. And you got to say, red to blue here is going to be your best color change. Red to red is going to be less easy, and red to orange also less easy. So the choice of your metal ion indicator depends on the pH. Um, because these metal ion indicators are usually also acid base indicators because their color changes with pH as well as whether it has a metal. Your chosen indicator therefore has to match the pH that you need for the metal you want to analyze. So like the color change there is important. Um, the color change wants to, you want it to be easy to see. If it's not easy to see, you could use spectroscopy. Um, and so you could set up a spectrophotometric titration where you're using the absorbance of light to monitor the color change. Um, that's a possibility. The other thing is that you have to make sure that your indicator will give up that metal to EDTA, that the indicator doesn't bind the metal so strongly. If the indicator doesn't give the metal to the EDTA, this is called blocking the indicator, and that's a bad thing. Planning out your pHs and what indicators to use and whether to use an auxiliary complexing agent um, is something that we've got some handy charts for. This is from the Harris textbook. So by the way, props to Harris um, for compiling this. So color codes, light blue right here, means a pH region where the reaction with EDTA is quantitative. So let's just say that we're interested in magnesium. Well, we could react magnesium with EDTA between something around the lines of, I don't know, pH 9.3 to 10.9 looks like what that range of the bar is. The little letters underneath are indicator codes. And so erythrocin B would be a good indicator for the lower pH there. The parts where you see a darker blue right here are where you would also need to have the auxiliary complexing agent present in order to prevent hydroxide precipitation. And so you can see that that's usually at the higher end of the pH range on any given metal. So each of these things are different metals, and then what pHs you can work with, what indicators work where. Additionally, we have another set of metals. Um, and now here's your abbreviations for the indicators that are used on this particular table. This kind of chart can be really useful for you to figure out what pH you need to be at to be selective. Um, and so I mentioned that you can be selective about something. So let's just say that you had both aluminum three plus and mercury two plus, and you wanted to titrate one, but not the other. Um, so you want their concentrations independent of each other. Now, clearly we have this pH range here where we can do copper and, or not copper, sorry, I was looking at the copper pan. So we have this pH range here where we can do aluminum and mercury. So we could go ahead and we could get the total aluminum and mercury by going at say pH of four. Then what you could do is you can shift yourself over and measure again at a higher pH, like pH eight, and get only mercury alone and then by difference, determine what aluminum was. 
And here's the last slide that shows you more and exciting elements and what their good pHs are. So just to finish up here, I want to discuss the titration techniques. Um, so far through this presentation, I've talked about direct titration, which is you take the EDTA, you react it with the metal you're interested in, and they form a complex. Note the color choices here, red plus blue equals purple. Um, you might have to use an auxiliary complexing agent. Now, in contrast to that, we have something called a back titration. And in a back titration, you still have the metal you care about and the EDTA, but now you've used an excess of EDTA. So over amount. And that's formed your purple complex, but you also have some leftover EDTA. Now, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take that leftover EDTA here, so it goes into step two, and you're gonna titrate that leftover EDTA with some other metal. Now in this second step, because the other metal is the thing with a known concentration, you better know its concentration. You're making now a second complex. Now why in the world would you do this two-step thing called a back titration? Well, if your analyte is going to precipitate without the EDTA, right? If it's precipitated and you can't get it in solution to titrate it, we have a problem. So you better mix it with the EDTA and form that complex thoroughly in the first place. Also, if your analyte reacts too slowly, um, you can't titrate if it's going to take an hour for it to react, but you could dump a bunch of EDTA in there in excess, let it react, and then go and work with something in the second step of a metal that's faster with the EDTA. Um, this also can be done if you have an issue with blocking the indicator. So if your analyte in the first step blocks an indicator and you don't have a suitable indicator, then you just put the excess EDTA in there, and then in the second step, you can use an indicator that works with your second metal. A variation on this is the displacement titration. And so you have EDTA and another metal. Green here is the other metal. And you have an excess quantity of that. You mix it with the metal you care about. By the way, you know the excess quantity. You're like, okay, I'm gonna put 0.1 molar of EDTA other metal, for example. Unknown amount of metal you care about. EDTA prefers the metal you care about and swaps it out. And now you have this unknown amount of other metal in solution. And in the second step, you can use more EDTA to titrate that, and that lets you figure out the concentration in the first place. Again, you can use this if your analyte doesn't have a good indicator, but your other metal needs to have a good indicator. And also you have to be sure that the EDTA prefers the metal you care about more than the other metal for this to work. Okay, that's a brief introduction to EDTA titrations. It is a hexaprotic hexadentate ligand, binds metals completely in a one-to-one -one stoichiometry, um, does depend on pH, but it's very useful. Thank you for your attention.